Welcome to the muscle anatomy chapter. Previously, we just studied muscle physiology. So now that we know all of the details of how the muscles work, this chapter is a little less intensive. We can just take a bigger picture at the muscular system, learn some muscles and what they do, and how they help us move all of our joints that we've previously learned. So let's get started. Here are the learning outcomes for this chapter. As always, by the end of this chapter, you should be able to answer these learning outcomes. Just a quick review on this slide, the three types of muscle. First, we have skeletal muscle. This is the voluntary striated multinucleated muscle. And this is going to be 100% of our topic this chapter. We're going to learn several different types of skeletal muscles and what they do. And the other two types of muscle are smooth and cardiac. They are both involuntary. They are both uninucleated, smooth muscle having no striations, and cardiac muscle does have the striations. If this is still not quite sinking in with you, please take a look at the previous chapter. We covered this, we made this nice little chart, and we also covered this in the tissues chapter in chapter four. The functions of skeletal muscle. Primary function, definitely movement, right? That's what we're gonna be generally talking about. But we did talk about some other things as well. Back in the skin chapter, we talked about heat production and how we lose heat and retain heat. One of the byproducts or the side effects of using your muscles is heat is given off. Another thing is posture. You don't have to be walking or running to be using your muscles. You, If you're sitting up in a chair right now, you are using close to 100 different muscles just sitting upright. All the muscles in your lower back and in your spine, all the muscles in your obliques and your abdominal muscles are, and your neck muscles are holding your body upright. So remember, that's more of that isometric contraction. Protection and support, some of our muscles are going to help us in that. For example, our kidneys are kind of exposed. They're really not well protected by our skeletal system. We have those two floating ribs down there that sort of protect the superior portion, but the inferior, inferior portion is sort of exposed. So the muscles in your lower back serve as a protective tissue to those kidneys. And then last but not least, storage and movement of materials. We talked about myoglobin last chapter. We've also talked about the sarcoplasmic reticulum with the calcium, all sorts of neat things. But the main goal what we're going to be focusing on is movement. What do these specific skeletal muscles that we're going to cover actually do for us? Another great review slide here talking about the layers of connective tissue. So if you look at the picture on the right, we've seen this picture before, right? And you have the tendon that actually connects the muscle to the bone. And then you have those three different protective coatings, mainly made up of collagen fibers, that are protecting the individual sections of the muscle. So again, the structure protecting the entire muscle itself is called the epimesium. The structure or the bunch of collagen fibers protecting the fascicles, those islands that we talked about last chapter, was called the perimesium. And then protecting each individual muscle cell and muscle fiber is the endomesium. And I have these definitions again for you on the next slide. Also, nervous tissue. We talked about the neuromuscular junction. Remember that the, these skeletal muscles have to be excitable. They have to be irritable. If we send electricity down the pathway of the nerve to the muscle, we have to be able to release acetylcholine and get that calcium, sodium, calcium mechanism rolling so we can have an action potential in the muscle and actually contract our muscle with all that myosin actin troponin tropomyosin all those proteins that you learned last chapter 
So just some terms that we've already talked about. The endomesium covers the individual muscle cell. The perimesium is around the fascicles. Epimesium is the whole thing, the whole muscle. And then remember what a tendon is. A tendon is mainly just made up of dense regular tissue, collagen fibers, connecting a muscle to a bone. Unlike a ligament would be a bone to a bone. Picture of a tendon here, you can see that there's actually two muscles that connect to this tendon. They're called the gastrocnemius and the soleus muscle. But what we have is fibers, mainly collagen fibers, that are connecting these big calf muscles to your calcaneus bone. So literally fulfills the definition of connecting a muscle to a bone. We call this the calcaneal tendon, also known as the Achilles tendon, just an example. And then if you tear it, as you can see, that, that's not going to be good. That's a long, long rehab process. Terms that we have not discussed yet. So this is a new slide, new material here. Other terms similar to tendons and epimesiums and perimesiums, they're going to be pretty much made up of similar type tissue. Our first definition is something called an aponeurosis. And what this is, is a sheet of fibrous coverings, mainly collagen fibers, that are connecting a muscle to a, another muscle. So we've had muscle to bone in tendon, we've had bone to bone in ligament, and now muscle to muscle in something called an aponeurosis. And this is kind of rare in the body. I'm going to show you a picture with the abdomen area. Uh, that's the most common aponeurosis that most people think about, connecting our abdominal muscles, but you also have this in your head region. A lot of the uh, muscles around the scalp area are connected by this type of structure, these collagen fibers. You have a little bit in your hand, the palm of your hand region. You also have some in the back of your knee, but other than that, it's pretty rare in the body. Next structure is a tendon sheath. We learned what a bursa was a couple chapters ago in the joints chapter. Recall what a bursa is. It's just kind of a pillow fluid filled sac of synovial membrane, uh, of synovial fluid, excuse me, inside of the joint, right? And the tendon sheath is kind of the same exact thing. The difference is it's outside of the joint surrounding the tendon. So it encloses the tendon and it's lined with that same stuff, synovial membrane. And remember the synovial membrane is what secretes the synovial fluid. And the purpose of synovial fluid was lubrication, hydration inside the joint. And that's exactly what we're doing here. So not only do we have this fluid inside the joint, we also have the fluid outside the joints surrounding the tendons. And you have this in a lot of tendons, not just your wrist and ankle. These are good examples, but you have tendon sheets all throughout your body. So your muscles can move without popping or twisting over the actual bones, all those tuberosities and tubercles and trochanters we've learned. Your tendon sheets make sure that things don't rub the wrong way. And then last but not least on this slide, we have the deep fascia. Same thing, this is generally fibrous connective tissue, a lot of areolar tissue. And it's just extensions of those mesiums and they're just grouped to separate the different muscles. Um, usually you're gonna find this just all over the body, but under the skin as well, under that hypodermis, right on top of all the muscles. So I wanted to show you this picture to give you an idea of what an aponeurosis is, that new term. So if you look at the picture, the image on the left, and you can see all these abdominal muscles. Here's our uh, really ripped, jacked male or female. And you can see the six pack, eight pack that I'm kind of tracing around. These are, this is one muscle, but it's eight different parts of the muscle. And what they're connected by is this kind of white silvery looking representation. This is the aponeurosis. This is the bunch of collagen fibers. It's dense tissue that just holds things together. So remember the purpose of a collagen fiber is strength, and that's exactly what we're doing here. It's just holding all these muscle fibers and muscle sections together. 
Now we have over 600 skeletal muscles in the human body. We are just going to cover in this chapter some of the big major players and certain movements. So we're going to be <laughs> leaving out the majority of them. And what you're going to notice is that the size, the shape, the arrangement, the pattern of the fibers can be very different throughout the human body. And the strength and the movement produced by these muscles are related to those different characteristics. So we're going to introduce all of these different shapes and arrangements and how we name these muscles. And then at the end of the chapter, we're going to actually name them and talk about what they do. On the next few slides, we're going to introduce different shapes that you can see with these muscles throughout the body. For example, the first picture that you see is a picture of the latissimus dorsi muscles. You have one latissimus dorsi on the left and one latissimus dorsi on the right. Generally, these are called the lats in the, the gym world. And what latissimus actually translates to is widest and dorsi translates to back. So it's the widest muscle in the back. So it makes sense, right? Uh, very broad muscle, very wide, as I just said, and also flat, flat kind of against your back. Another example of a very cool muscle shape, one of my favorite muscles in, my, in the body, perhaps the favorite, is the sartorius muscle. And that's this highlighted red muscle. It actually starts up here near your iliac crest, top of your ilium bone. And then it actually crosses the femoral part of your lower extremity and actually inserts down that medial tibial area. So it's a very, very long, narrow, skinny muscle. And we'll see a lot more similar to, those, to that sartorius muscle in just a bit. Other shapes you'll see are bulky muscles. Picture your calves. Just take a look at your calves. They, they tend to be big bulky muscles. One of your calf muscles is called the gastrocnemius. We also have circular muscles throughout the body. For example, we have circular muscles around our eyes that help us squint and wink and close our eyes. We also have circular muscles around our lips that help us move our lips and close our mouth. We also have triangular muscles, and you can see the deltoid is a triangular muscle. Delta, actually, if, if you've ever studied Greek alphabet and fraternity, sorority, it, delta is a kind of a triangle. So the deltoid muscle is this upside down triangle in your upper arm. So we can classify muscles based on the overall shape of the muscle, like the deltoid muscle. We can also classify them based on the arrangement of the fascicles and all the fibers. So the example on this picture is the parallel type of muscle. And you see the parallel muscles in your upper arm. A great example of that is your biceps brachii muscle. Also on the flip side of your arm, the triceps brachii will also be considered a parallel muscle. And basically you just have a whole bunch of fascicles and fibers. They're all just kind of running the same way in these parallel fashions. Another type of arrangement is a convergent muscle. And basically what convergent means is all of those fibers, instead of saying staying parallel, they converge or come to one place on the tendon or the bone. So a great example of this is your big chest muscle, your pectoralis major, and it's up here with the letter B. So we are to draw our sternum. Remember we have our manubrium and our body and our xiphoid process. And then here we would have our humerus bone out here somewhere, curved humerus bone. But all of those fibers converge, they get really, really skinny at the tendon and converge near that humerus area. So they're really, really thick, really wide at the sternum, and then they get tiny towards the humerus. So it's converging on that point. Another arrangement we have is oblique. You have oblique muscles around your eyeballs that help your eyeballs move in certain directions. You also have oblique muscles in your abdominal region. 
And if you take a look at this black arrow that I'm drawing, you can see some of these abdominal fibers, and they're kind of diagonally or slanted-like. And that's what the word means. Oblique actually means diagonal or slanted. And you could also see them uh, more detailed on the picture on the right as well. You see the external oblique go this way. And what's really, really cool is the internal oblique crisscross the opposite direction. And what that does is it reinforces your abdominal wall and it actually makes your entire abdomen as a unit really, really strong. So you can lift heavy things and cough and sneeze and vomit and not have your intestines burst out of you. So that arrangement is on purpose. It's very, very important. An additional type of muscle arrangement are pinnate muscles. And pinnate muscles kind of look, their, their fascicles make this feather-like appearance. So basically what we're going to get is this diagonal line of fascicles throughout the muscle. So for example, with a unipinnate muscle, what you're going to get is you're going to get a tendon in green. And then the fibers are all going to connect to that tendon, kind of like a feather, kind of this in this diagonal orientation like that. But it's only on one side. That would be a unipennate. A bipennate, as you can see over here, circled in purple, would just look more like this, where we would have both sides of the tendon have these diagonal looking fibers. And then multipennate, you're just going to have multiple tendon areas and you're just going to have these things all over the place. Multiple insertions, multiple what we call bellies of the muscles. So you can see some examples now that I'm clearing my drawing out. You can see that a unipennate muscle can exist in your finger, the extensor digitorum. Your digits are your fingers and toes, right? An extensor is just going to help you straighten or extend your finger. An example of a bipennate muscle is the rectus femoris muscles. Or your, well, the rectus femoris, sorry, it's one muscle, my mistake. And then it's a part of a group of muscles. And then the multipennate we just talked about is the deltoid. And the deltoid actually has three bellies. And I'll show you a really cool picture in just a little bit about the deltoid. And this is why some folks argue about how many muscles we have in the body. Some say we have 620. Some say we have 640. Because it just depends on how you classify the muscles. Some folks say the deltoid is one muscle. And some folks say, no, it's three muscles. You have a posterior deltoid, a medial deltoid, and an anterior deltoid. So not an exact number or an exact science when it comes to numbering all the muscles in the body. As I mentioned, we have circular muscles. You can see with the eyeballs. We're going to name all these in just a little bit. Uh, you also have sphincters. You also have smooth muscle. Not, not, we're not really going to dive into that quite yet. We'll get there next semester. But you have sphincters or circular-like muscles at each side of your esophagus. Basically, you swallow the food into the first sphincter, and then it opens up into your stomach. You have a circular muscle surrounding the connection between the stomach and the small intestine. You also have a circular muscle-like structure connecting the small to the large intestine. So these circular muscles are all throughout the body. We're going to just focus on the skeletal ones, mainly in your face for this semester. OK, very important slide, especially for you physical therapy and PTA folks, because this is going to be a big part of your future studies, is how the muscles attach. So every single muscle has a starting point and a what you can call a finish point, right? Uh, let's take your biceps brachii, right? Your big uh, arm muscle. It has to connect to multiple places. It connects in your shoulder area and it connects near your elbow area, right? And then you move your elbow, you flex your elbow, biceps brachii. So let's actually get the definitions to the start and finish points of every single muscle in the body. The starting line is what we call the origin. And this part of the muscle does not move. It's stationary. It stands still. It's more of a stabilizing part of the muscle. So the finish line, what we call the insertion, this is the part that actually does the movement for the muscle. 
So take a look at this picture on the right, and this is the deltoid muscle that I told you about. Really great picture because you can see all three aspects of the deltoid muscle. And what I want you to do while you're sitting at home or wherever you are is move your shoulder. Now, what's actually moving, uh, basically like do a jumping jack. And when you're doing a jumping jack or doing arm circles or whatever, what's actually moving is your humerus. So take a look at these attachment points for the deltoid. You have an area, now that we know all the bones, this is really fun, we can talk about this stuff. It connects to the scapula and the clavicle area, right? And then you can see this is also a, def a great example of a convergent muscle. It converges on this one tiny little tuberosity on the humerus. So my question to you is what part is moving? When you do arm circles or when you do uh, jumping jacks, the part that's moving really is your humerus. Your arm is moving when you're doing those motions. Your clavicle scapula are pretty much stationary. And if they are moving, guess what? That's not the deltoid, that's other muscles in your neck moving that. So when you were just isolating the deltoid, if we we're just to abduct, abduct your arms to the sides, what you're moving is your humerus. So by this example, what we're looking at is the origin of the deltoid is near that clavicular scapular area, and the insertion is on the humerus. So the humerus is what moves the deltoid. And I'll give you some more examples of origin and insertion as we progress through some of these muscles that let you know what part is actually moving the muscle. So as we just mentioned, when it comes to contraction of a muscle, the insertion is what's actually moving. Generally, the origin does not move because muscles around it are stabilizing it, also tendons and ligaments also stabilizing it. So if you were to take a look at this picture on the right and you see that this person is about to, or potentially, maybe they're putting it down, but let's say that they're picking up the glass of water, glass of milk, and they're going to bring it to their mouth. What they're going to do is they're going to flex their elbow and decrease that joint, right? That was the definition of flexion. So we have some attachment points here. Let's look at the biceps brachii muscle. The one we typically think of when we think of you know flexing our our arms our biceps so the attachment points are well, we have multiple attachment points they're near that glenoid fossa and then another little tiny landmark on the scapula and then another attachment point is on the radius bone something called the radial tuberosity so those are the attachment points now what I want you to do is flex your elbow, flex your biceps. And my question to you is what is moving? Is your elbow moving or your shoulder moving? And when you're flexing your biceps, your elbow is moving. So the origin of the biceps would be here in the shoulder region and the insertion would be here. So as your notes say, the insertion generally moves closer to the origin. And this is a great example of this bottom bullet point, many muscles are going to have multiple points of origin and insertion. So the biceps have two origins and one insertion. Um, a big muscle in your hamstring we're going to talk about, one origin, two insertions. Your lats, your latissimus dorsi that I showed you a few slides ago, has like six origins. It's, it's everywhere. It's a crazy muscle. So it's not always just point A, point B. Sometimes it's multiple point A's going towards a point B or vice versa. Now let's begin putting some definitions to the different types of actions a muscle can perform based on what we're actually doing. So if you are flexing your elbow, raising that water bottle to your mouth, your biceps is doing a specific action and your triceps is also doing something, right? You're also you're, you're stretching your triceps on the back side of your arm while you're flexing or contracting the front side. So let's put some words and terms to it on the next few slides. This first bullet point is very, very true. Muscles almost always act in groups. So go back to that deltoid analogy that I told you to do with the jumping jacks or moving your arm. 
And remember, most of the movement is happening in our upper arm, our humerus. But some of you probably did have some movement with your clavicle scapular area. It's because all of those other neck and shoulder muscles around that area are also moving. Right? And I mean, just think about walking. Think about how many muscles you have to move to, to walk, uh, to get in and out of your car, to, to just to sit down. I mean, you have, to, <laughs> you have to position yourself over the chair, and then you have to squat to get down in that position. So you're using loads and loads and loads of muscles just to do the most simplest, basic daily activities. Now, as I mentioned on the previous slide, when some muscles contract, others kind of stretch and have to relax. And basically, a good principle or a good way of remembering this is if a muscle on the front of your body is contracting, more than likely the muscle on the back is stretching or relaxing. So the muscles on the front of your arm, when they contract, the back of your arm muscles relax and vice versa. If you contract the back arm muscles, you're stretching the front arm, the anterior arm muscles. Um, when you stretch your quads, if you were to take your foot, and we all did this in PE back in the day, right? When take your foot and kind of just bring it up towards your glute area and just bend your knee and hold that area. It's a nice, feel good stretch. Right, so as you're stretching those quad muscles, what you're doing is you're contracting your hamstring muscles on the opposite side. So if, if we have muscles on the front and back, they're generally going to have opposing effects on one another. So we're going to put some definitions to these types of terms. We're going to have prime mover, antagonist, synergist, and fixator muscles on the next couple slides. Okay, a prime mover. What a prime mover is, is a muscle that's doing the main job or the main movement. And the example I give you here is with plantar flexion. Remember, plantar flexion is we're pointing our toes down or we're walking on our tippy toes. And the main prime mover for that muscle are, or for that action are your calf muscles. And your calf muscles, as you'll come to find out, the big ones are called the gastrocnemius. And the still big ones, just not as big, are called the soleus muscles. So this is what's doing that. When you walk on your tippy toes, those are the two big muscles you're contracting. Now, we, we can do this with, with almost anything, right? If I abduct my arm, the prime mover is my deltoid. When I flex my elbow, the prime mover is a, an anterior arm muscle. When I kick a soccer ball, the prime mover are those big muscles in your femoral region, your quad region. So it just depends on what action we're talking about. We're going to have several different prime movers all throughout the body. But I, I found this picture, and it's just a really good picture. You can see the lower leg, um, and you, you can see the plantar flexion of that foot ankle joint. So that's a prime mover, doing the main job, right? If we're doing a push-up, there's dozens of muscles working, but what's really actually pushing you off of the ground mainly is your chest muscle, your pectoralis major muscle. And then your deltoid and your triceps muscles are helping you do that. So what an antagonist is, is that opposite example. So when we are using the front muscle and the back is stretching, the back is considered to be an antagonist or vice versa. Now, very important, though, the word antagonist usually means to, to oppose or to, like, fight with, right? And that's not really what's happening. All, it, all it's doing is just the opposite effect. So if the biceps brachii is contracting. All that means is the triceps brachii is just stretching or relaxing. That's all that means. So in our example here in the picture is if we are contracting these lower leg muscles on the back side of our tibia and fibula, what's stretching? If we're contracting the back muscles, we are stretching the muscles on the front. So on the front of your tibia, you have a really cool muscle called the tibialis anterior, and that's what's stretching. So everybody go on your tippy toes as you're sitting down or walking or standing, whatever you're doing, and what you realize is the back calf muscles are really squeezing and contracting, but you're actually stretching your shin muscles on the front side. If you go into dorsiflexion, it'll have this opposite effect, right? Go walk on your heels or point your toes up toward the ceiling. Now you're contracting that front muscle, 
and you're stretching your calf. So that's what an antagonist is. Then we have synergists and fixator muscles. Synergists, if, we, if you think of a synergy, that's just things that work together for a common good or to make things better. So these types of muscles contract at the same time as the prime movers to make the movement more efficient. And an example I gave you on the previous slide was a push-up. Right? You use a lot of muscles to do a push-up. You can't just isolate one muscle during a push-up. You're going to fall on your face or not be able to get off the floor. So yes, your chest muscle is probably the most sore after you do a lot of push-ups, but you have to use your deltoids. You have to use your triceps, your latissimus dorsi, your quadriceps, your abdominal muscles, even your glutes to stay in that straightened position. So those are all synergist muscles to help you do those push-up movements. Example in your slides here, you have flexion of the hip. So basically what that is, is if you're sitting, you're flexing your hips or just bring your knees to your chest. We have two main muscles, or really you can make the argument for three, two or three main muscles that help you flex your hip and bring your knee up to your chest. But there are muscles that help with that too. And the muscles that help are your quads. So the muscles that actually are the prime movers, this is one of the big guys. This is called the psoas major. We'll talk about that. Hopefully, hopefully we'll talk about that later. But that's really what's working to help you sit right now. And then if you're really sitting or you're really crunched up, your quadriceps kind of help make that happen even more efficient and bring your knees closer to your chest. And then last but not least, we have a fixator muscle. And a fixator muscle really is a stabilizer muscle. And that's, those are the muscles that are kind of in that origin area. Also, if you're just doing like a big dynamic complex movement, it's just so you don't fall over, right? If I'm standing on one leg, I'm using hundreds of muscles, but a lot of my stabilizers are in my hips, my glutes, and my abdominal region, making sure I don't fall over. So that's stabilizing me. Another great example are these little tiny muscles in your shoulder area that make sure that your shoulder capsule doesn't break apart. And those are called rotator cuff muscles. Some of you may have injured your rotator cuff in the past. So remember when we were talking about the different joints in the body, we talked about the glenohumeral joint or that shoulder joint, and we compared it to the hip joint with the femur head and the acetabulum. Now we said that the acetabulum is really, really strong, right? Or that, that joint within the acetabulum, really strong. But because it's so strong, we limit a little bit of flexibility. We lose a little bit of mobility. And we talked about the shoulder joint being very, very mobile, but it can be injured very easily because it's, sometimes it's too flexible, too mobile, right? That glenoid fossa is very, very shallow. So the job of these fixator muscles is to make sure that this thing, your humerus head, doesn't just fall out of its place. It just keeps everything together, fixes it in place, hence the name. And this slide here is just basically putting all of module three together. We started with joints and we talked about muscle physiology with the neuromuscular junction and how the brain controls muscle contraction. And now we're talking about the different types of muscles. So this is basically module three in a nutshell, as, as you can read these bullet points. Next, we're going to talk about nomenclature, which just basically means naming. So how do we get these weird Latin names for the majority of these muscles? Well, it's not as complicated as you may think. So depending on what muscle we're talking about, it can have many different criteria for naming. Sometimes it's really, really easy, and we just name the muscle based on where it's located. Uh, for example, we had the extensor digitorum, that finger muscle, right? Digit means finger phalange, and that's what we name it. It's just a finger muscle. And then the extension part is the function. What does it do? So you have extensor digitorum muscles that extend your fingers and toes, 
And guess what? You also have flexor digitorum muscles that flex your fingers and toes. So sometimes it's really, really simple. We talked about the shape, right? Some muscles are circular, some are triangular-like, some are uh, just broad and wide, some are long and skinny. So we can sometimes get the name from that. We talked about the direction of fibers a little bit with the pennate and the convergent. Uh, we're going to talk about some ab muscles, the abdominal muscles. We're going to have four different types of muscles, and that's all named after which direction those fibers are going. So we're going to have an external oblique, as we pointed out, and an internal oblique. They're both going to be slanted, but in opposite directions. The number of divisions or heads. So we have the biceps brachii because we have two origins. We have the triceps brachii. How many origins do you think we have there? Or how many muscle bellies do we have? Three. We have the quadriceps area. We're going to have four quad different muscles in that area. Points of attachment. Sometimes it's going to be really easy. We're going to name it after all those bones and bone markings. So Dr. D, why did we have to know about the tibial tuberosity? Why did I have to know about the mastoid process? Well, all those bone markings sometimes come in handy with your muscles. For example, the sternocleidomastoid muscle connects or it actually inserts on the mastoid process. If you don't know what the mastoid process is, you don't know where that muscle is, you don't know what it does. So you're welcome. <laughs> and then last but not least, the size of the muscles. We have uh, muscles that are called pectoralis major, big chest muscle, and then we have a pectoralis minor. We have a, in our face, we have a zygomaticus major, we have a zygomaticus minor. You also have gluteus muscles. You have a gluteus maximus and a gluteus minimus. Maximus obviously being a little bigger. So many different criteria, and I'll show you some more examples on the next slide or two. So here are a few examples on this slide. Some of them we've talked about already, some of them we haven't. One that we did not discuss yet is the brachialis muscle. And the brachialis muscle is this smaller muscle in the upper arm. And remember, the upper arm is called the brachial region, so brachialis makes sense. And believe it or not, this is actually the prime mover for elbow flexion. This is the main muscle that helps you bend your elbow. A lot of folks think it's the biceps brachii because that's what we like to work out and show off at, the, off at the gym and in the mirror, but the brachialis is really the, the meat behind that specific movement. An example of a muscle or a muscle group named by its function are the adductor muscles. We have, I'm trying to draw an arrow, we have a muscle called the adductor longus. We have a muscle called the adductor brevis and the adductor magnus. What do you think they do for a living? Yeah, they adduct, exactly. They bring your legs closer together towards that midline. We talked about the deltoid muscle being that triangular shape already. And then the direction of fibers as well. Deep, deep in your abdomen, I'm going to blow this picture up for you on another slide so you can see it a little better. But deep inside your abdomen, we have something called the transverse abdominis. And what that means is these, well, if my mouse wasn't crooked. Let's try that again. These fibers go horizontal. How about that? That's better. So they go transversely across the abdomen, hence the name transversus abdominis. Then we have rectus abdominis. Rectus means straight, right? If you're to rectify a, a bad situation, you're trying to straighten out the situation. So these muscle fibers are going to go up and up and down, hopefully straight up and down. There we go. Right? And this is what your six-pack, eight-pack muscles are composed of. And then we have the obliques, as I mentioned. Those are the diagonal-type muscles. Other ways to name the muscles, we can talk about the divisions of heads. I mentioned the biceps and the triceps and the quads, all of that. The point of attachment, the sternocleidomastoid, really long, crazy, weird muscle. But guess what? It attaches and originates at the sternum, at that manubrium. Clido refers to the clavicle. And then this long muscle in your neck goes to your mastoid process, that big bump behind your ear on the temporal bone. So without knowing those bones and those bone markings, you wouldn't know what this muscle is or what it does for that matter. And because it inserts here on your mastoid, it helps you move your head. 
And then I gave you the example of the gluteus maximus and minimus, and there's also a gluteus medius as well, based on size. All right, everyone, now that we have all of the introduction stuff done, what we're going to do for the rest of this chapter is cover, like I said, just major muscles throughout the body. We're leaving out over, probably over 90% of muscles in your body, but these are some big movers, some big muscles that you should be aware of. And what we're going to do is we're going to work, we're going to start in the face, and then we're just going to work pretty much inferiorly. We're going to go to the, the neck area, and then we'll go to the the thorax arm area and finally we'll just end with our lower legs so let's get started as you can see muscles of facial expression there are many many muscles I mean dozens of muscles in your face alone we're gonna cover four big ones that we want you to be very familiar with and these four are gonna be on the next four slides So our first muscle is called the orbicularis oculi muscle. And you can see in the picture, the bright red is what we're highlighting here. So orbicularis, this is one of those circular or sphincter muscles, right? It's an orbit kind of structure. And oculi, if you wear ocular lenses, what do you wear? You wear glasses, right? So oculi is gonna be referring to the eyes. So what you need to know for every single muscle that we're going to talk about is, one, you need to know where it's located. So you need to know this is the muscle surrounding the eyes. Number two, you need to, you need to know what it does. What is its action is what, what we call that. Function, action, same thing. So what the orbicularis oculi does is it helps you blink. It helps you close your eyes. It helps you squint. Uh, it helps you wink. All of those kind of things. So it helps you move the muscles right around that orbital area. Our next muscle is the zygomaticus major muscle. And once again, there are big muscles and small muscles. We have a smaller muscle than this called the zygomaticus minor as well. But the zygomaticus major is your main smiling muscle. So if you take a look at the origin and the insertion, it's pretty cool. The origin is right on that zygomatic bone, hence the name zygomaticus, right? The insertion, as you can see in your notes, is the angle of your mouth, kind of the corner area of your lips. So what does it make you do? Remember, insertion is the part that moves. So what happens is this muscle draws up towards the origin and it helps you smile, helps you laugh. And a lot of times if you go to like a party or just a function or whatever and your cheeks start to hurt from fake smiling or laughing too hard or whatever, uh, this is the muscle that gets fatigued. If you're not used to smiling a lot, this muscle can actually become very uncomfortable if, if you work it too hard. Our next muscle is the orbicularis oris. Now this looks very familiar, right? Because we just talked about the orbicularis oculi. So orbicularis is referring to the orbital shape, but instead of oculi, we have orus. And orus, is similar to oral, is going to be mouth, right? So if you maintain oral hygiene, you brush your teeth, floss your teeth, that kind of thing, same thing. So these are the muscles around your lips, and what they help you do is pucker up and kiss. They help you stick your lips out. Also, they help you close your mouth. Uh, picture like a toddler not wanting to eat their smashed peas or carrots or something and they make that face where they just kind of lock their lips down together so you can't put a spoon in there that's also the orbicularis oris muscle helping that action or that function and then last muscle that we're going to cover on the face is called the buccinator and the buccinator is a really cool muscle what this helps you do is compress your cheeks against your teeth and basically picture it's kind of like a fish face uh, if you were to like indent your cheeks inside into your face that's what it does so what it helps you do is it helps you blow out candles on a birthday cake helps you whistle and also helps you suck like a milkshake like a really really thick milkshake that you have to like work you use your mouth muscles to get it through the straw that's the buccinator muscle that helps you do that This next slide is covering the muscles of mastication, and mastication simply just means to chew. 
So these are the two major chewing muscles. And as you can see, one is called the temporalis muscle, and the other one is called the masseter muscle, hence the name mastication. So the temporalis muscle, really easy to identify, because if you notice, I mean, look, I mean, it's a big muscle, it spans a big range, but what is this bone called right here with the mastoid process and the external auditory meatus and the zygomatic process? This whole area is called the temporal bone. So temporal, temporalis muscle, makes sense. The masseter muscle is this area that I'm putting a black rectangle through. This is pound for pound, believe it or not, the strongest muscle in the entire human body. Basically, based on its size, it is the strongest muscle in the body. It packs a big, big punch. We talked about the mandible bone being the strongest bone, uh, one of the strongest bones in the entire body. Uh, definitely uh, up there. And the masseter muscle is no different. Very, very strong muscle. So these are the two main muscles that help you chew your food. There are many muscles that move our head, but one of the big major players is the sternocleidomastoid. A lot of times in anatomy talk, we abbreviate this as the SCM. Of course, you need to know what that means. You need to know the whole thing, sternocleidomastoid, but as you get further in your academic careers, that, that's, that'll become a very popular abbreviation. So the sternocleidomastoid, once again, sterno refers to the sternum, so that would be right in this area with the arrow. Clido, referring to clavicle, this area there. And then the mastoid process of the temporal bone, right here. So the origin is by the sternum and clavicle, and the insertion, the moving part, is by the mastoid process. So what does this muscle do? It has multiple actions, but the main one is flexion. It actually flexes your head. So they call this in some circles the prayer muscle. If, if you pray yourself or if you've watched others pray, a lot of times they bow their head to pray. And, and that's that's one of this, uh, this sternocleidomastoid, one of their main movements or roles is to help you do that. Kind of bow, tuck your chin down toward your chest. Now it does do other things. It does help you laterally flex your head. And what that means is basically try to touch your left ear to your left shoulder. And now feel on the right side of your neck. You'll feel that big muscle right under your mastoid and kind of go all the way down to your clavicle. You'll feel that kind of sticking out. And if you rotate to the left, so left ear to left shoulder, and then spin your head to the left, you'll really feel it stick out on your sternum clido clavicle area. So it helps you do a lot of cool things, rotation, laterally flexion, but one of the main jobs is also just plain flexion, like I said, with the prayer position. Some important muscles of the thorax. Uh, we're gonna cover three muscles on this slide, and all three muscles are very important in respiration and breathing. So we'll cover this in more detail next semester when we actually cover the respiratory system. But I do want to introduce this because this is muscle, right? Skeletal muscle. Now, as I mentioned, three types of muscles. We have the external intercostals. We have the internal intercostals. You actually have another, a third layer here called the inner internal intercostals, believe it or not. Um, and they, they work similar to the in internal intercostals. But the most important one out of the three that you see on this picture is the diaphragm. The diaphragm is what's really helping the lungs inflate with air and then deflate with air as you exhale or breathe out. Uh, as you can see, enlarges the thorax, causes inspiration, which is breathing in. Without the diaphragm, you're not breathing, you're, you're dead. The intercostals are important, but as long the diaphragm is, is the main mover. Like I, same thing with the sternocleidomastoid. A lot of muscles move your neck, but the SCM is the, is the main prime mover. So as you can see, the role of the external intercostals is to elevate your ribs. So this would be breathing in or inhaling. So they actually kind of separate the ribs. And then the internal intercostals will depress the ribs. So this, is what, this would be our exhaling where it collapses the ribs and brings them closer together. And as you can see, the opposite functions are just based on the muscle fibers, the orientation. So picture the external and internal oblique in your abdomen. 
I talked about that a little earlier ago, right? We have the external oblique fibers in the upper right hand corner. I'm drawing these fibers like this, kind of slanted. And then on the internal side, they're going the opposite direction. And because those fibers are oriented opposite of each other, they can do opposite actions. So know these three muscles, know what they do. But once again, we're going to get into more detail next semester with them. Moving a little inferior now, we have the abdominal muscles. And I just mentioned the external and internal oblique, their orientation, their fibers, right? So if we have the external oblique fibers, for example, going this way, and internal obliques going this way. We also have that third layer, the transverse abdominus, going transversely or horizontal. And when you put the combination of those three layers uh, in that area, stacked on top of each other like that, you get a really, really strong area. And, and you know, our core is pretty strong in this area. I mean, regarding all the things that we do, like snot, uh, sneezing, coughing, right, lifting heavy stuff, we need to protect this area. So to give you an idea of what we're looking at here, we have the external oblique. I'll, I'll do that in green to, to show you. Uh, these fibers right here, they go pretty high actually. And then they go all the way down here. So your side muscles, diagonal. Once again, oblique means slanted or diagonal. Inside of that, you have your internal oblique. So if you look at the picture on the right where it's more zoomed in, you're going to have your external oblique here. And then if you can appreciate the drawing, the illustration, what we did was we took a slice out of the abdomen and went a little deeper here. So you actually have to remove the external oblique to see the internal oblique. And that would be those purple lines right there. And then same thing, in order to see the transversus abdominis muscle, sometimes it's just called transverse. A lot of folks don't add that transversus. But in order to see the transversus abdominis muscles, what you have to do is you have to cut the internal oblique. So you have to go even deeper to get to this deep, deep, deep layer. And then the rectus abdominis just kind of holds everything together in the middle. So these three layers are on your sides, as you can see in this picture. And then the transverse abdominis actually does go all the way across. And then the rectus abdominis is your six pack, eight pack. So that's this whole area in the middle. And once again, this is connected by a bunch of collagen fibers, these eight little sections. And that is called an aponeurosis that connects those muscle to muscle. Okay, so for you bodybuilding or physique fanatics, a lot of folks try to isolate these different abdominal muscles. They try to do crunches to hit the rectus abdominis and do side crunches to hit the obliques and side bends to hit the obliques. And they try to suck their belly button in to hit the transverse abdominis. And while yes, you can do certain exercises to target a muscle more than the others, but to to disappoint you, it, your abdominal muscles work together. It, it is a it is a unit. Um, when you do a sit up, you are working all those muscles. When you are walking and running, you are using all those muscles. When you turn, you are using all those muscles. Uh, when you cough or sneeze or vomit or have a bowel movement, <laughs> go to the bathroom, you are using all those muscles. So, what these muscles do? is they compress your abdomen, such as going number two, right? You have to compress the abdomen in order to have enough force uh, pr and pressure generated to force out the stool. Um, same thing with coughing. Next time you cough or next time you have a sneeze coming on, do me a favor. Just put your fingers uh, on either side of your belly, uh, by your belly button or by your obliques. It doesn't matter. And you'll feel your abs really, really tighten. Um, posture I mentioned sitting upright your, your ab muscles and along with the lower back muscles are constantly working constantly working uh, I mentioned defecation forks forced expiration even if you're breathing really hard go for a run around the building or around your house real quick uh, you'll start breathing and you'll use those belly muscles even more childbirth definitely oh gosh gotta gotta mention childbirth yeah 
um, haven't experienced it, but I can only imagine how much pressure and force and how much work those abdominal muscles have to do in order for that to get accomplished. And of course, it flexes the trunk of the body. Now, now, now same thing here. The rectus abdominis, yes, helps you do a sit-up. It helps you bend down and touch your toes. But your transverse abdominis is still working as well, I, I promise. If you do a plank, people do planks and stuff to strengthen their core and, you know, strengthen their abs. You're, you're working transverse abdominis. You're working, you're, you're working everything as, as a stabilizer muscle. So they work usually in, in units together. So now that we've covered the muscles of the thoracic abdominal region, like the torso core area, uh, let's work our way back up temporarily and talk about muscles that move the pectoral girdle, the scapula shoulder area, and then we'll start with the arm muscles and then finish with the legs. So our first muscle we want to introduce here is called the trapezius muscle, and, or also known as the traps in, in the gym world. And the trapezius muscle is a very large muscle, and actually... I love these pictures. I got we get these pictures from Wikipedia, um, and they're really good. And a lot of times they're super spot on and accurate. But even here, this picture, I would argue that the trapezius actually goes down even lower. I, I would say it goes closer down to that lumbar spine down here. So if we were to finish this diamond-looking shape, it should be more like this. It's a very very large muscle, and it, you know you you take the corners of it you get this diamond trapezoid looking structure. Now, what does it do? So I, I say about the size because on your notes, it tells you one thing. It tells you it shrugs your shoulders. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna elevate your shoulders. So it's gonna bring your scapula up towards your head. And yes, absolutely your trapezius muscles do that. You cannot argue that whatsoever. But that's really just the upper traps. When you contract those muscles, when you shrug your shoulders, you're really just working this area. What about everything else? What, what about if you're pulling something? A lot of folks say, well, those are the rhomboid muscles. Well, the trapezius muscles are a lot bigger than your rhomboids. So when you're pulling something or when you're working, doing a back workout, bringing anything closer towards you, you are working the trapezius. You're just working the middle and lower fibers of the trapezius. So for your exam... I do want you to know, shrugs the shoulders, but just for your common knowledge, when you go to the gym or just anything, I want you to know that your trapezius muscle is a very large muscle, and it does a lot more than just raise your shoulders up and down. Next muscle is called the serratus anterior muscle, and this picture actually is really accurate. love this picture. They did a great job with this. The serratus anterior muscles are on top of the rib cage, so they are superficial to those intercostal muscles. Those intercostal muscles that we talked about are in between the ribs, so these are on top of them. And the role of the serratus anterior, take a look, it is connected to the scapula bone right here. So what it does is protract the scapula. And remember what protraction means is to bring something forward, right? If we were to bring our jaw forward or jut our jaw forward or round your shoulders out, that's the serratus anterior. So if we were to move it in an anterior direction, such as punching something, that is mainly the action of the serratus anterior. Now, are there other muscles helping you out with the punching? Absolutely, right? Your deltoid, your tri your triceps, all, all those things for sure. But this is the prime mover of moving that scapula forward to hit something. Another muscle that moves your arm area is called the pectoralis major. And what we're looking at here is the left side of the body, left side of the upper body. So here would be the person's head. This is the sternum. So then we'd have the left chest and the, the left arm down here, right? So this is a very, very big muscle, uh, convergent muscle, meaning once again that it's really wide here at the sternum and it all converges at this one point at the humerus, kind of like a deltoid makes this triangle shape. And the pectoralis major does a lot of cool things. Um, it does flex the upper arm. So basically what it does, if, if you were to bring your, instead of doing uh, a B duction, just bring keeping your elbows straight, bring your shoulders up or bring your hands up towards your face while keeping your elbows locked. That's flexion of the shoulder. Um, but the main thing it does is it adducts your upper arm. It brings your arms closer together 
for example, if you're clapping and you bring your chest together or you're squeezing something between your two hands, that would be your pectoralis major. So it adducts them anteriorly. And all that means is your hands are in front of your chest while adducting. Because on the next slide, we're going to introduce a muscle that adducts posteriorly. So stay tuned. And that muscle is called the latissimus dorsi, the lats, which we've already covered before, right? So a very broad muscle in the back. And what this does is it adducts the arms posteriorly. So kind of hard to do this, but try to clap your hands in the back. Try to bring your hands together in the back. And what you'll feel is that muscle squeezing. And it also helps extend your upper arm, so it actually does the opposite effect of the pectoralis major. And this is a perfect example of a synergist and antagonist. This is the first example that we've come across with that. Your pectoralis major adducts your arms in the front. Your latissimus dorsi adducts your arms in the back. Opposite effects. So this is typically your, uh, your pull-up muscle. Uh, if you're hopping a fence or you're, you're climbing something, uh, this is the big muscle that you need to help propel you. Yes, you're using your brachioradialis and your brachialis and your biceps and all those arm muscles, but your latissimus dorsi is what's going to actually propel your body up the fence or the wall or whatever you're climbing, tree. Next, we have the deltoid muscle that we've already talked about before. So the deltoid muscle has three different arrangement of fibers, or what I call three bellies. You have the posterior deltoid in blue there. You have the what they actually call in a lot of gym circles the medial deltoid. And as you can see, that, that's very, very false. The technical term is actually called the lateral deltoid. Some people also call it the middle deltoid. That's okay, too. But I think what happened in gym circles just for years and years and it stuck is they confused middle with medial. And this is actually the most lateral of the three, the green one. Uh, so we definitely should not be calling that the medial deltoid in, in anatomy class. Uh, but around the gym, you might get away with it. So what these fibers do is it depends on what part of the deltoid we're talking about. So the flexion of the upper arm, bringing the arm straight up in front of you, is the anterior part. So I'll, I'll try to color code it here for you. So red would be flexion. The blue would be the extension, bringing your arm kind of behind you. And then green, since it's straight on the lateral side, or it's, it's basically on the outermost portion, it would bring it outer most in direction so it would a b duck the arm it would bring it away from the midline so it just depends on what uh, part of the deltoid we're talking about so it basically moves the humerus in multiple different directions next we're going to talk about the muscles of the upper arm so we have a few of them first we're going to talk about the biceps brachii muscle and what, what I'm going to do for the rest of this chapter when we start talking about these arm and leg muscles is I'm going to give you a more musculoskeletal and clinical approach to the action of these muscles. So in your notes, you can see the muscles that move the forearm. Yes, they move the forearm, technically. But when we flex our muscles, when we contract our muscles, what's really moving are those joints that we talked about, right? Those hinge joints, that saddle joint, those pivot joints, those ball and socket joints. The joints are what moves. The forearm is just a region. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not being nitpicky here, but just for you all going into the fitness and the physical therapy industries, you want to be a little bit more, not, not exactly accurate, but you just want to be precise with what's actually causing the movement. So we're going to move the elbow. The elbow joint is what's actually moving when you're contracting the biceps brachii, right? Flex your biceps, your elbow bends. Does your forearm move? Yes, it does. But your forearm, once again, is just a big block. It's just a big region. The elbow is what's moving the forearm. It's not the forearm moving the elbow. So I'm not crossing this out by any means. But just know that forearm and elbow regarding muscle and joint movement are synonymous. 
So I'm going to do the same thing with the lower leg and the knee and the, and the ankle and all that. So I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to keep reiterating that point. And that's it. That's what the biceps brachii does. Once again, it's called biceps because it has two origins and it also has two what we call bellies of the muscle. So you can see one origin here in red and then another one in green right there. And brachii referring to the brachial region. Oh, and, and then, okay, one more thing it does, sorry, uh, flexes the supinated forearm. So, what, what, yeah, so flexion is the main job, but, um, so supination, remember supination is holding the bowl of soup, right? So, it would basically be your typical bicep curl would be your hands are basically in anatomical position and you just flex your elbow. That's mainly the biceps brachii. When we pronate or put our hands in more of a neutral state, that's going to be more of the other muscle coming up in just a second. And what I was referring to was the brachialis muscle, really the prime mover of elbow flexion here. And this muscle is really, it really, really shines when we flex the elbow in a pronated position. And once again, forearm and elbow are going to be synonymous. So with a pronated position, it's a little awkward if you're doing like a, a bicep or, you know, like a dumbbell lift with this position. But picture from more of an organic or a functional standpoint, go back to that pull-up example. If you're climbing up a, a rock climbing wall or you're climbing up a tree, your hands aren't supinated. And if they are, let me know because you're weird, weirdly strong if you're climbing up a tree that way. But your hands are going to be pronated and your forms are going to be pronated. So climbing up a fence, climbing up a gate, something like that, it's this muscle helping you actually do that, not so much the biceps brachii. Then we have the brachioradialis muscle, and this is a synergist to the biceps brachii and also the brachialis, but it's, it's a little weaker. And, and the reason why it's a little weaker is because most of the muscle, as you can see, is in the forearm, and the tendon also actually runs all the way to that styloid process on that radius bone. But it, it, it basically assists. It helps with the semi-pronated with the brachialis, and it helps with the semi-supinated with the biceps brachii. So it's more of a synergistic muscle. And then we have the antagonist to all three of those muscles we just talked about. So the biceps brachii, the brachialis, and the brachioradialis all flex the elbow or flex the forearm. The triceps brachii, since it's on the back side of the humerus, it's going to do the opposite. So the opposite of flexion is extension. So it's going to extend the forearm or extend the elbow. And you can see where we get the name triceps, right? We have three colors here. So we have three, what we call bellies or three parts of the muscle. We have what we call the lateral head of the triceps in yellow. We have the long head in red. And then in green right here, you can see this little sliver. It's just underneath all that. The long and lateral head are really big. But you can also see this little sliver in green right here, if you're really looking. I don't know if you can see that or not. But just pretend there's a little green thing right there. Uh, that's called the medial head, that, that green sp uh, part. So the, the medial head is big. It does cover a lot of the humerus. But these two red and yellow heads just kind of overtake it because they're more superficial. And they all insert on that olecranon process that you learn. So they help with elbow extension. So now that we've covered the upper arm area, we're going to move down to the lower extremities and cover some major muscles in the pelvic uh, upper leg femur area and then also the lower leg and we'll wrap up this chapter. So this slide looks probably kind of overwhelming to you because there's a lot of muscles on here, iliopsoas, rectus femoris, yada, yada, yada. Um, we're going to cover all of these muscles on their own respective individual slides coming up. But just to show you this picture, just to kind of give you an idea where we're heading, and here's some actions. Iliopsoas flexes your thigh or flexes your hip, and we're going to talk about all of these. And we're actually missing the gluteus muscles. We'll talk about that on the next slide. So we're going to get to all of these. 
So the gluteal group. The gluteal group consists of three major muscles, and they all start with gluteus and then end with something different. So let's start with the gluteus maximus, meaning the largest. And that's going to be this picture on the right side of the screen. And you can see how it's rotating. It's just a really large muscle. It kind of starts in that sacrum area, and then it goes all the way down to those trochanter areas. And it just covers all of that area. It covers the back of the ilium, covers the ischium, and even covers a lot of the femur area, the head and neck. It's just a very large muscle, hence the name gluteus maximus. So what it does, if, if while it's spinning, if you, if you notice the insertion point, I'll try to pinpoint it next turn, it's on the back of the femur, there and there, backside, posterior side of the femur, okay? So because it's on the backside of the femur, when this muscle contracts, it's going to bring the femur more posterior because it's already on the posterior side. So what this does, the action for the gluteus maximus, is it extends the hip joint or in your notes as it says it extends the thigh but once again what's controlling the thigh is the hip joint so basically this is your kickbacks if you're uh, lying on your belly and you're bringing your leg up in the air or if you're just standing up and you like picture like a horse kicking something and you just jerk your leg back real quickly that's going to be your gluteus maximus helping you jerk your femur posteriorly now, these next two muscles are going to look very similar, right? I mean, you look at this one spinning here. It looks almost identical to the gluteus maximus, right? But it's not because look at the insertion. The insertion is on the very lateral aspect of the femur on the greater trochanter. As hopefully you can see, I, I, I can only get the spinning one, sorry but I think it's kind of cool at the same time. It's on the very, very lateral aspect. And what this is called is the gluteus medius muscle. And the reason why it's called medius is it's kind of the middle one, medium. So don't, don't get it confused with medial. Okay, it's the medium between the two. What they should call is gluteus intermedius, I guess. But because it's on the outside of the femur where it inserts, it's going to move the femur further outside or further lateral. So the job of the gluteus medius is abduction of the thigh or the hip. So it's going to kick your leg further away from that midline. And then last but not least, we have the gluteus minimus. And notice the insertion is the exact same place. It's not exactly the same, but it's really, really, really close right near that greater trochanter. So it's going to have the same action. Because it's in the very lateral aspect of the femur, it's going to bring the femur more lateral. So as you can see, gluteus minimus, it does the same thing. Ad abducts, abducts the thigh and the hip. Now, it's just a little smaller though, right? Look at the origin. Look where it's located on the ilium. It's just not as big. So the gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus is a perfect example of synergistic muscles. They work together. They do the exact same thing. And notice, once again, the gluteus maximus is a little different because of its insertion. Because it inserts on the back of the femur, it's not going to abduct the hip. It's going to extend the hip. Another muscle that abducts the hip or the thigh is called the tensor fasciae latte muscle. And let's get our orientation right in case this picture is not making sense for you. Here is our sacrum. We're looking at the front of the sacrum. So here's your spine with the black arrows. We're looking at the front of the spine, those intervertebral bodies and the intervertebral discs. Or sorry, the vertebral bodies and the intervertebral discs. So we're looking at somebody's right leg, and we just chopped off the left one. So here is the knee in purple. So hopefully we have our orientation right now. So what we're looking at with this highlighted muscle is at the very lateral aspect of your hip joint area. So the gluteus muscles are on the posterior side, and this muscle is on more of the anterior side. But since it's on the most lateral aspect, what it's going to do is it's going to do the same thing. It's another synergistic muscle that helps abduct your thigh and your hip. And it's a kind of a crazy name, right? Tensor fasciae latte. Fun to say. But it's the same thing in the gym circles, or in the really running circles, 
gym folks don't really work out your TFL too much, although you should. It'll prevent a lot of injuries down the road, trust me. I'm a big fan of working out my TFL because I've had so many injuries. Um, but that, that's what, it, in runner's land, that's what it's abbreviated as TFL, generally. Next is the pectineus muscle. Not a fun muscle to injure. I've actually injured this uh, about like six years ago. Awful injury. Kind of hard to diagnose, too. But the pectineus muscle is this really crazy muscle. It originates on the pubis bone. And it inserts on the inside of the femur, the medial side of the femur. So I hope you're catching a theme here. The insertion really is important. It dictates the movement. All those, glu the gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, tensor fasciae latte, they're all on the outside part of the hip. So they bring it further outside or AB duct. The pectineus is on the medial or inside part of the femur. So it's going to do an AD duction action, adduction. It also does help with flexion, but that's really not its main function. Main job of the pectineus is to adduct, bring your legs closer together. Next muscles are going to be the adductor muscles. We can call these the adductor group because they all start with the word adductor and then something. So we have the adductor brevis, we have the adductor magnus, and the adductor longus. And I'll try to highlight these for you. Adductor brevis is, brevis is referring to the shorter one, shortest, right here. Adductor longus is the, the middle one between the three. And then the adductor magnus is this really, really huge one, large one. And pretty simply put, what do you think they're going to do? They all insert on the inside part, the medial part of the femur. So they're all going to bring the femurs closer together. So they adduct your upper leg. And that's it. Next, we have the gracilis muscle, and the gracilis muscle is really, really cool, really unique. The main thing we want you to know is this is the innermost muscle, so it's even more medial than the adductors. So it's this muscle right here in this, near this midline. So it's very medial on this pubis bone, and then it goes straight down and inserts on the medial kind of posterior aspect of the tibia. So what you need to know is this first part. It adducts the thigh because it's very, very medially or medially located. Um, but if you really, really want to go the extra mile and kind of know another thing that it does, it does help the hamstring group flex the lower leg because it's on that back side of the tibia. Just like that gluteus maximus was on the back side of the femur, so it brought it further back or posterior. The gracilis does kind of insert on the posterior side of the tibia, so it can assist, help with uh, flexion of the knee, flexion of the lower leg. But a deduction is the big one we need you to know. Next, we have the quadriceps, and the quadriceps are made up of four muscles in this anterior femoral region. And the good news is, yes, you, you do need to know the difference, different anatomy. You need to know which one's which. But the good news is they all do the same thing. They all work together. So what they're doing is they are specifically extending your knee. And once again, in your notes, it says lower leg, but your knee is what's moving your lower leg. So extension of the knee, straightening out your knee is what the role of the quadriceps. Now, that's the primary function. The iliopsoas muscles, which I did not show you. Let's go. Let's talk about the iliopsoas muscles. <laughs> um, the iliopsoas muscles are these muscles right here in green. You do need to know this. I just can't go back in my video. Um, ilio, it refers to the ilium bone. So it's actually a combination of two bones. It's the ili, sorry, two muscles. It's the iliacus muscle and then what we call the psoas major muscle. And these two muscles together are what we call the hip flexor muscles. They help you bring your knee to your chest. We were talking a little bit about this earlier. Okay, so the iliopsoas muscles, I'll spell that for you if you don't want to go back to the previous slides. Ilio and then psoas is spelled with a silent P. So it's a combination of two muscles. These are your main hip flexors or thigh flexors. Now, only to a certain point. 
If you're standing up and you're bringing your knee to your chest, yes, the iliopsoas is doing the majority of that work. But as you get closer to that top part, the rectus femoris and the other quadriceps muscles can assist or be a synergistic muscle to help you with that. Okay, so please note, I kind of skipped over that on the, one of the slides. You do need to know the iliopsoas muscle is the main hip flexing muscle of the body. The main role of the rectus femoris and these vastus muscles is once again, knee extension. So let's talk about where these things are located. In the middle, what you can see in this picture is three muscles. In the middle that I'm trying to highlight in black, right here, there we go. This is the rectus femoris. And once again, what we're looking at, if you look at the very top right of the picture, I'm drawing the sacrum, and then here would be our coccyx area. You can see a little bit of the pubis area. So this is the midline. So this muscle that's medial is the vastus medialis, and then this muscle on the lateral aspect is the vastus lateralis. Makes sense. Now, the one muscle that you can't see is the vastus intermedius, and that's because it's right underneath this big major middle one, this rectus femoris, but it literally just sits just like this. That would be the vastus intermedius. So it's a lot smaller, but still very important to help you extend your knee. So as you can see, all these insert on the tibia, specifically that big bump on the tibia, What's that big bump on the anterior tibia right by your patella area? See, why did we have to learn these bone markings? Because now the muscle stuff makes sense. The tibial tuberosity, right? All these muscles go past the patella onto the tibial tuberosity. When you contract these muscles, they pull on the tibial tuberosity and voila, your knee moves. Magic, except it's not magic. It's anatomy and physiology. All right, my favorite muscle in the human body, just, I don't know why, it's just, it does a lot of cool actions and it's just fun to say, sartorius. So once again, the location of the sartorius is, it's kind of on this iliac crest, the lateral part of the ilium, that's the origin, and then it, it crisscrosses, it actually crosses towards that midline, and then it wraps back around towards that medial tibia, really just cool. So this would be the insertion down here. And what it does is a lot of things. So hang with me here. Yes, it does flex your lower leg, which means flexing the knee joint. So it does bend your knee. That is one thing. I'll put a one by it. Number two, it externally rotates your hip. And basically what that means is it kind of kicks your foot outward. I'm just gonna put X to rot. And then it can also play a role in hip flexion, similar to the quadriceps that we just talked about. So I'll put hip and then F, L for flexion. And then one last thing it does with the external rotation of the hip, it also A, B ducks the hip to an extent, just a little bit. A, B ducks the hip, not much, but it can. Okay, so put all those together and you get this really cool thing. So if you bend your knee, you kind of swing your foot out a little bit, you bring your knee to your chest kind of, and then you abduct it. And what you get is crisscross applesauce sitting in Indian style. So all of those motions put together, I mean, you, you think about the many different movements, but what you're doing is you're sitting in Indian style. And if you're sitting in Indian style, like I am right now, as I'm talking, you'll notice your knees are bent, your knees are kind of flaring out to the outside. So that's external rotation of the hip, maybe a little bit abducted if you're flexible and your hips are flexed, you're sitting. And if you can feel your hip flexor muscles, you are in kind of a crunched position right there. So the sartorius allows you to move in those multiple movements in order to accomplish this position of sitting in Indian style or crisscross applesauce is what I'm told is the more common way of saying that. Okay, next we have the hamstrings group and the hamstrings 
are three muscles that all do the same thing. So it's very similar to the quads, except it's the opposite. The quads all work together to extend the knee, and the hamstrings are all going to work together to flex the lower leg or flex the knee joint. So you can see the biceps femoris flexes the knee. The semitendinosus flexes the knee or the lower leg. Semimembranosus flexes the knee or the lower leg. Now they do also assist with extending the thigh. They can help with extending that thigh or that hip joint with the gluteus maximus, but the prime mover is the gluteus maximus. But if you're really, really, really flexible and you can extend your hip very far, then your hamstrings will take over and kind of help you go even a little further. Okay, so let's introduce these three muscles where they're located. The biceps femoris. Um, is the largest of the hamstring muscles and it's the most lateral okay so the biceps femoris we're looking at a posterior view here so this is the biceps femoris on the outside part then you go in between the three muscles and the middle one is the semi tendinosus and then the most medial one is the semi membranosis and that I always remember that in school semi membranosis M for membranosis M for medial so that would be this one here on the medial aspect so if we're going from lateral to medial it'd be biceps femoris semi tendinosis semi membranosis or just flip it going from medial to lateral so once again what are they doing they're helping you flex your knee so they're a classic antagonist to the quad muscles and they can also help the gluteus maximus out with extending your hip joint. Okay, we're down to our last three muscles, and these three muscles all interact with the ankle foot joint, helping with that either dorsi or plantar flexion. So the first muscle out of those three is called the tibialis anterior. Very easy to remember because it's on the anterior aspect of the tibia bone. And what this muscle helps you do is dorsiflex. So it helps you walk on your heels or point your toes up towards your head or towards the ceiling. Now a secondary motion it helps you do is invert the foot. Remember inversion is where you're kind of rolling your ankle to where your soles of your feet, the bottom of your feet, turn medially toward the midline. But the main job, the main function, the primary function of the tibialis anterior is the dorsiflex. Very real quick, cool note on the tibialis anterior. This is one of the very rare muscles that don't have tendinous attachments in the, in the origin area. So this, a lot of this belly of the muscle actually is attached to the bone itself, the tibia. And this is why you can get shin splints. You can't get elbow splints or shoulder splints or heel splints. You only get splints in your shin. And the reason why is because when this muscle gets weak or when it just gets overworked, what happens is it actually starts pulling on the periosteum of the bone. And when you start flaking pieces of the outside of the bone off of the bone, you get really, really sharp pains in your shins. And we call them shin splints because of the orientation, the anatomy of this muscle, the tibialis anterior. So change your shoes, rest for a long time, and then once you're back at it, we'll rest and then change your shoes, and then just kind of ease into it and strengthen this muscle, shin splints should go away. Last two muscles are gonna help us with plantar flexion. Uh, the gastrocnemius is the more superficial of the two, so it's the gastrocnemius muscles and then the soleus muscles on our next slide, our last slide. This muscle right here, this is what we typically think of when we think of our calf muscles. Very strong, very bulky, and you can see it goes all the way down the Achilles tendon. It would be right in this area right here, and it connects all the way down to that calcaneal region. So it helps you walk on your tippy toes. Now the soleus muscle is the deeper of these two muscles. So the really, and the gastrocnemius is really, really big and bulky, like I mentioned, so it covers the soleus. So you really can't see it that well unless you're looking at it from this angle, from an anterior angle. So similar to the gluteus maximus, the gluteus maximus is so big, 
you can't see the gluteus minimus or the gluteus medius at all. What you have to do in order to see those muscles is you have to cut and remove the gluteus maximus. Same thing here. So by looking at it from this angle, we're looking deeper. We're looking from the front view, but these muscles are located on the back of the leg. And because they're located on the back of the leg, they go down to that Achilles tendon and the calcaneus, and they do the same thing. They help you plantar flex your ankle foot area. All right, everyone, that is it. You have learned some of the major muscles and their actions and their names and their unique characteristics. Uh, let your instructor know if you have any questions, study up, and make sure you are ready for your Module 3 exam. I'll see you next time.